of my God, we're putting everyone in jeopardy. We have no resiliency. Some of those states and counties had severe drought. Some had moderate. Some had not so much. But they all had one thing in common. They collapsed like dominoes. That should concern us. We put on this fertility. Some of it gets into the plant. Here's your nitrogen from fertilizer. Here's your nitrogen from the soil. When you move to um, more, more diversity, when we used to have more diversity, it was a different situation. Now, the more we want to go to a monoculture, there is, not a, there is not a law against growing continuous corn in the U.S. There's not a law against that. But there's a very high environmental price that everybody has to pay. If, yes, sir? If you have a soil that has quite high organic matter, like say 4%, and you put it on dry fertilizer in the spring, will that um, organic matter serve as sort of a bank and a reservoir to hold that fertilizer rather than it running off your field? It, it will help. Higher, higher levels of soil organic matter always buffer uh, many issues, that being one of them. But there's a number of issues. Anytime we get higher levels of soil organic matter, they buffer a lot of our problems. It doesn't take it away. Like Melvin, you're, you're still going to bleed to death. And that's why soil degradation is such a subtle thing. You, you drive through the row crop country, you don't, you don't think of this so much. Just, just don't drink the water. Does commercial fertilizer have any negative effect on the biology? The question is, does commercial fertilizer have any negative impact? We know it reduces the fungi spores or the fungi population to less than half of what native rangeland is. We've seen that on Gabe Brown's. He was up here in the native rangeland with the fungi component. You're down here on the cropland. Okay, so we, we know that's due to phosphorus. And, and ARS has substantiated this at Brookings. You can Google that one and just read it. It's a lady researcher. When we do this in the fall, we don't get a big plant, but we get a pretty substantial root. But keep in mind, we're feeding the biology. We used to terminate all growth at harvest time. In our old production model that degraded us, we allowed nothing to grow after harvest. We tilled everything. Nothing grew after harvest. Now we don't feel that way. Now we want it to grow after harvest. It's carbon. Carbon is the currency of exchange between the biology and the plant. Minokan Farm, we use, uh, we have, there's 10 fields out there, we use at least one season, or uh, one uh, warm season cover crop mix and at least one cool. The warm season, even grew an old district conservationist, but the warm season usually has more biomass and, uh, and you can also really stage out your flowering plants. And uh, I got into, uh, I think I forgot our wedding anniversary. And so I went out uh, that evening and I gathered up a cover crop bouquet. It was outstanding. You cannot believe to what level I was elevated. It was unreal. <laughs> and I learned a lesson that day. Besides, don't forget your wedding anniversary. I, w I learned that there's a whole opportunity here of cover crop bouquets. And then we had, if you know, David... Um, David Brandt out of Ohio spoke at our workshop two weeks ago. He is selling cover crop bouquets in the city. He's got so many sunflowers, so many of this, so many of this. He packages them up, he sells them. I think he said he sells them for 20 or 25 bucks a piece. They bring them in once a week. You cannot believe how much money he has made from selling cover crop bouquets. It's, it's another, another stacking. This is a cool season. You can see the phacelia. You can see the, cool, the uh, field pea. You can see the canola. Uh, you can see the radish. If you're having a bad day, and if you work for NRCS, you may have a bad day on occasion. If you're having a bad day and you stop here and you walk out into that cover crop, it is alive. You can close your eyes and listen. 
It's unreal. The pollinators, the insects, it's just alive. It's unreal. And the aesthetics. I've never gotten in so much trouble. I've had to use the flowering plants from the cool season yet. I'm holding that back in case I have an issue someday. Okay, livestock integration. Our livestock never used to be on our cropland. Why would you want to bring why would you want to bring livestock onto cropland? They're just nothing but an issue with compaction and going through fences and you got to supply water. It's a big headache. Why would you possibly want to do this? Let's talk about that. Oh, and by the way, that's just a beautiful day in North Dakota. That's <laughs> That's one of our better days, let me tell you. Pardon? Was it what? Yeah, toward the end of June. Yeah. Yeah, we do have snow recorded, I think, in every month of the year. It's sometime in history. Okay, this is, um, uh, this is Gabe's place, and he decided to bring on 370 yearlings onto cropland. Well, why would you want to do that? He had a cover crop planted out there, so let's take a look at it. This is what it looked like when they were done mob grazing. When you would look straight down, you could see no soil, okay? Because you're only going to graze a certain portion of that because the herd you're feeding underneath weighs more than the herd on top of the soil, okay? Now, that's pretty green, low carbon. Who's it going to benefit? Big, big push on the bacteria there, no question. The following year, he let it get more mature, more rank, higher carbon. Came back in on that same field and he mob grazed that field as well. That's what it looked like afterwards. Now that looks a lot ranker, doesn't it? Now who's that going to benefit? Fungi, because they have to break down the complex chains, okay? Now let's look at the biology. You see this 6,000 nanograms and even this 4,200? When you're up in that area, this has been my perception, this is why Mr. Brown can take that commercial fertility out of there. He's got some high numbers. That's a lot of mineralization that's going to occur. Okay? He's got other land that he has not farmed very long or he just rents and he's starting it. He's going to use commercial fertilizer on that land. It's the Kevin Costner theory. You know, if you build it, it will come, but it's not there the day you got it, okay? You gotta build it. Soil health has to be built. You look at this, the actinomycetes, I see we had a bit of a change there, and for some reason, this one is lower than this one. I can't answer that, uh, but they are kind of the MPs that regulate issues, okay? It's, it's, remember, it's where our antibiotics come from. The bacteria is higher, fungi is significantly higher, okay? Significantly higher. It made a huge difference in the fungi. Now look at the ratios. This one's getting down there pretty low. And keep in mind, you want to get something below 10, okay? Below 10. Mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal is strong. And so it, it, it was an interesting uh, scenario to look at those two. But when you get up over 4,000 nanograms, you got a lot of mineralization starting to occur. Let's, let's switch over to the cattle end of it just, just briefly. This was uh, Jim Barrett. He's one of the people on our soil health team. He had four pasture system, ran a couple hundred cow calf pairs, four pastures, four herds. That was, our, that was our production model that we started with. Herd in each pasture all season long, okay? That was in 04. Well, in 05, we put in 11 pastures and we put all four herds together. Now we've got 10 pastures in recovery and we're using one of them. So we thought, Jim, we said really good things about Jim, had a tour out there, thought it was really looking good. And he looked at us and he said, well, I'm not very satisfied. So in 06, he went to 22 pastures. Still one herd. Now he's got 21 pastures in recovery. Okay. And he's using one, he's in one of those at a time. The following year, he went to 29. Okay, now there's nobody making him do this, but he understands, he sees it. He's connected the dots. 
he understands, he understands recovery and grass. So now you're looking at a situation where they're on there just a few days out of the growing season. It's like, um, you remember um, Alan Savory when he came from South Africa to the U.S. in the 80s? He was the grazing guru. A lot of you know who he is, okay? Still alive. And I went to his class in Bismarck in the 80s, and he was explaining a concept. And he said, if you're on a hilltop in Peru, and you've got a mule, or jackass, whatever, and it goes down the hill for water each day. At the end of 365 days, what do you got? You, you got a trail. You probably got some water erosion. You probably got nothing growing in it. It's probably looking a little ugly. You take this same guy and put him back up on the hill with 365 mules. And they all go down the hill one day for water and they all come back up that day. Now you got 364 days of recovery and you used it the same amount. This is very similar to what Lewis and Clark described in their journals. And since they went right through Bismarck, we rely, I've read several versions of their journals and they're fascinating. They describe in there how the grizzly bear, and we had grizzly bears at Bismarck, they're, they were a plains animal, they were sitting on top of the chain plains animal. We don't think of them that way now. We think of them hiding halfway up a mountain in Montana now, which is the only place we've allowed them to be. But they were a plains animal sitting on top. So the grizzly bear, the wolf, the coyote, all of the predators would follow the huge herds. They weren't chasing them, they were describing this. And, they, and, the, and, uh, the, and from the viewpoint of the huge herds, I'm talking about the elk, the deer, the bison, etc. They describe it in there, and especially in that Pier to Bismarck area, when you look at those journal entries, and they describe how you can hardly see anything but these herds. It's just that huge. And then it describes how the predators are following them, and the predators were taking the sick, the old, the weak, and the fat. They just did a little cleanup every day. It wasn't like an assault. They just followed along and did a little cleanup every day. Can you imagine how healthy those herds got over time? Would have been unbelievable. Jim Barrett, crazy talk. Valmerangus Ranch, land coming out of CRP. What better use than to put it in a grazing system like this? Cut down those pastures, it was already grass, leave it in grass, is that not good use of a taxpayer fund? I think so. We added the water system. We do shallow water pipelines. We got miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of shallow water pipelines. They're one foot under the ground, maybe two at the most. We freeze seven to eight feet deep. Doesn't matter. You know, it's it's a high density polyethylene pipe. It doesn't matter if the water freezes in it or not. Okay? So it, it, and it works. It has for many years. This is Gabe Brown. Keep in mind now, Gabe's usually gonna work somehow. This was his original system. This was CRP, a couple pastures here, a few pastures here. So we went to work and uh, we put in a 40-some pasture system. He understands recovery. This is a grazer who, when you are talking to him about a grazing system and you're at this level, he's already over here. Okay. Now, that's not quite enough for him. So what he does in these individual pastures, there's 43 or 44 of them in there, he strip grazes those down with a single wire electric in. So a lot of this acreage has livestock on it less than one day a year. He and Kenny Miller, Kenny Miller works in our office and some of you maybe have had a chance to listen to him. They're the, some of the premier grazers in, in North Dakota or in the country. They will both tell you they leave more grass at the end of the year than they used to produce. Untapped resource. Mismanaged, we allowed it to degrade. These are just some of the, uh, huh, the through some books in here. Um, this is Ray Weil, I mentioned, uh, the book I mentioned, it has all of the data in it uh, regarding how much fertility goes into a plant and all that type of thing. Uh, 14th edition, when I was in college, I had the 7th edition. Okay, that was a couple years ago. 14th edition's got websites and all kinds of neat stuff in it. 
Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden is a story of uh, a woman on the Missouri River, Mandana Rikara Hadatsa tribes on the Missouri River bottom, who described the agricultural system to a man who put it into a book. Okay. One Straw Revolution is a very similar thing to Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden, except it happened in Japan on an acre and a half with rice production. Interesting. Gets a little. The, one Straw Revolution, very good book, gets a little zinny at the end, but it, it's a good book. Uh, managing cover crops profitably, if you're looking at cover crops, that's a must read. I've read it several times. Guns, Germs, and Steel, that's just for people who want to open up their mind more. Uh, this is an individual who explains why some things developed on some continents and not on others. Okay, and it's, it's an interesting read. Soil Biology Primer by Elaine Ingham, especially for compost and anything for biology. Okay, and just some websites I threw in there also. So, our sheep talk. That, that's just, sorry, North Dakota humor. I should have known I was in Colorado. Okay, um, what time of the day is it? 3 5. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. What? Oh, sure. Sure. I will scoot, scoot back to those. What I'm going to suggest is, if, if you want, we'll visit for 20 minutes. Okay? I believe that's Gabe Brown. And then Mandak is uh, Manitoba, North Dakota, has a zero-till association. Okay? Those are just some ones I threw on there. So. Whatever you folks want to talk about. It's that or I got a drink. And, uh, do I understand this right? Sweet corn whiskey? Man, out of the box thinking, I like that. Never heard of that. Yes, sir. You mentioned that you'd like to give the back end to us. Um, uh, could, you, could you talk more about carbon to nitrogen ratio and sorry. rate of uh, mineralization and what's happening? We know that nitrogen is going around certain places, but we don't talk much about carbon and the, the idea being Okay. Without um, losing a sweet corn or an onion crop. Okay. How do you how do you increase soil organic matter? And and let's start when when our group started to educate ourselves. Our first question we asked was, how do you destroy soil organic matter? How do you destroy it? How do you lower it? Anybody? Over fertilization. What else? Tillage. Why tillage? Tillage takes the carbon, converts it to carbon dioxide, and it goes up. This got proven at Morris, Minnesota, ARS, by Don Rykowski. He proved that. Okay, he had the little boxes. They did all the tillage, put the little boxes. They captured the carbon dioxide, and they captured it in, in sequences of time. And if you want to know about carbon dioxide uh, and soil organic matter and those kind of losses, he, he's retired now, but he's, he's still active. Uh, so, so, how do you build it then? We, we've got to look at the other way, right? We minimize soil impact. We minimize disturbance. Okay, so you minimize disturbance. We learn from the Morrow data that the more diversity we bring on here, we're that is going to help. We heard from speakers uh, earlier today that have added large amounts of um, uh, manure and they saw soil organic matter levels rise. Okay. Depends how much of that you have, but we saw that rise. I can tell you from experience, um, every farmer who went in, followed down the soil health road, and I guess I should clarify, 70% of the farm, Burley County is a million acres in size. 70% of the farmers in Burley County are doing just what you saw on the screen. 20% of them have a little more disturbance. They are direct seeding with uh, small sweeps or knives, okay? Still got a good system, a little bit more disturbance, maybe a little less diversity. 10% have told me to the face, to my face, that they will die before they change. And that's, that's, that's human nature. I mean, that's, I'll, I'll take those odds. I'll take that 70, 20, 10. I'd like 100, but I'll take the 70, 20, 10. Every one of those individuals has something in common they have all increased soil organic matter levels. 
The first 10 years, it took, it took us 10 years, sometimes 12, to go 1%. Then we brought in the cover crop combinations. Now we didn't use the cover crop combinations when we started. And we had a really small bucket to hold water and nutrient. But after we got about 10 years in, well, all of a sudden, here we come into the cover crop combinations. Those that adapted the cover crops went up again. It's sunlight. You're harvesting sunlight. You got to you got to be able to harvest sunlight, and that's a, that's one of the big keys. It's very difficult to take one component. And I think uh, uh, Brendan's Jenga game uh, described that pretty well last night. It's really hard to take one component and say this is the one I'm going to apply, and I'm not going to apply anything else, and expect that you're going to have tremendous results. Uh, it, it's a, there's a holism to it. So you start looking at the holism of it. So the question was, you know, in terms of uh, soil organic matter levels, well, it took us, excuse me, it took us 10 years to gain 1%. Second 10, the second percent came faster. It, it's a time element. We used to talk within the agency, and I'm sure the NRCS people remember this, we used to talk in the agency about how many eons of years it took to build soils. Well, you can accelerate biological time. If you have low crop diversity, no-till system, you will gain extremely slow. If you have high crop diversity, you will gain quicker. If you add cover crops, you'll gain quicker. If you will add livestock integration, you'll go quicker yet. How much do you want to, uh, how, much, how much can you do or are you willing to do to gain that? The road to soil health, our road, is not your road. There's no question of that. Our road is not your road. We're all going to end up at the same place, but we're all going to take a different street and avenue to get there. Every, every farmer in here, you're going to have differences between every farm in here. Because they're all unique and they're all special. You know, how much labor do you have available? How old are you? What kind of resources do you have? All of these are unique and special items and specific. And you have to identify resource concerns. We heard one of the speakers after lunch talk about identifying resource concerns. Dead on. That's a good starting point. Really good starting point. We knew what ours were. We didn't have any soil organic matter. We didn't have any pores in our soil. We didn't have any soil aggregates. We didn't have any diversity. Our cows had no legs. We had all these things going against us. The only thing we had going for us is that we were down so low that sometimes I think we only had one way left to go. But the carbon nitrogen ratio, uh, that was also one of the other questions. Carbon nitrogen ratio is a lot of uh, the nutrient release. You get too high of a carbon nitrogen ratio. For instance, uh, you get a 60, 70 bushel wheat crop and that residue is laying on the surface. That's going to tie up a lot of nutrients. If you come along and you put a cover crop into that wheat, it creates a microclimate, it accelerates the decomposition. Because now you're feeding the biology, everything's going to go a little bit quicker. But that's a lot of chewing for the microbes. That's a very high carbon to get it down to a 10 to 1. Okay? So there's all these things, all these things play in here. But diversity, very powerful.